Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a word from the Lord. Glad you're with us tonight. Getting ready for the tent to come, the tent meeting to start Monday. So I hope you're making plans. Uh, it's a good time. We've been having some nice weather. So come on out to the tent, the Calvary Flea Market there on Highway 58 between Martinsville and Danville. I guess it's Broswell is actually the the, uh, uh, the location there. Right before you get to Whispering Pines, if you're going toward Danville from Martinsville, if you're coming from Danville, it's right past Whispering Pines. It's on the north side of the road. And so uh, we hope you come out and visit with us. Study God's Word with us. We want to invite you. Uh, you'll be a very welcome guest. And I know this has probably been said numerous times, but we never pass the plate. We want you to uh, know we don't want your money. We, we're not looking for anything from you other than a little bit of your time and give us a chance to teach you the Bible. If you have a Bible question, there will be opportunities available for you to ask a question. If you want to ask it publicly, we'll give you a microphone. You can actually ask a question. Uh, Fred, if you've ever been to any tent meetings, that just doesn't happen. And so, uh, or, or any meetings for that matter, in the denominational world, it just doesn't happen. They don't want to answer questions. They don't want you to ask questions. They want you to just come in, get hyped up on the music, pass the chicken bucket, and, you know, then go home feeling good. We want you to come, open the Bible. Don't worry about the chicken bucket because it won't be there. You won't pass the, we won't pass it. You just come, open your Bible, study God's Word with us. The scriptures will be on the screen just like we're doing on TV uh, when we bring our lesson on TV, we'll put our scriptures up there. Same thing will happen under the tent. And uh, if you want to ask a question, we'll be glad to answer it. So come out and, and uh, visit with us. Study God's Word with us. 7 o'clock each night. Uh, there at the at, uh, Calvin's Flea Market in uh, Broswell. And we hope to see you there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. My contact information, if you'd like to reach me, at from the Lord at gmail.com. 276-340-2653. We'll put our phone numbers up later on and you can uh, give us a call and we'll be glad to take your call on the air. We'll be discussing a, a comment that was, that was uh, on one of our YouTube videos tonight. And it has really, in a way, it has to do with the tent meeting. Not directly, the man doesn't talk about the tent meeting, but what he says or the statement that's made that we're going to be examining will... Uh, fit very much in tune with what will be uh, happening, what will be happening under the tent. So, what could that be, you might be saying? What could that be? Well, let's just get to the question. This was a comment on one of the videos, I believe it was uh, from March in 2016, maybe it's an older video. It says, the books of the Bible were inspired by God, not dictated word for word by God. Now that's a very interesting statement here, friends, because if that is true, if that is, if that is true, then there is a very, very dangerous uh, thing that's happening with our Bible. If that is true, if the books of the Bible were inspired by God, but not detailed word for word, how do we know that the Bible is then the Word of God? Why not just call it the thought of God? Why not? Why would you even say it's anything about uh, connected with God? How do you know if it's not the word for word of God? If it's not detailed word for word? So what I want to do now is we're talking about inspiration. How do we know the Bible is inspired? How do we know the Bible was uh, given to us word for word by God? And friends, the reason why I say this has to do with our tent meeting is because when we are preaching the Bible to you, whether it be on television or in our tents or whatever. We're giving you God's Word. And you can have confidence that this is the Word of God. And so tonight I want you to know that when we give you an answer, it's going to be right from this book. Now, how do we know that the Bible is dictated word for word, not just a book that's inspired by God? Well, friends, one thing you need to understand is when people say, inspired by God. When we say inspired, we're not talking about something that just uh, uh, gives you an idea and motivates you to do something. Like like tonight we were driving up here and saw a beautiful sunset. Well, you know, that, that inspires me to paint. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about inspired in the sense of it's God-breathed. We'll get to that in just a moment. But notice, the, uh, the, the, the viewer 
made this statement that the Bible, the books of the Bible were inspired, but not dictated word for word. Well, what does he mean by that? Maybe we need to ask that question. What does he mean by that? Is he saying that God is just behind the Bible? That he gave Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John? Well, here's some idea. You know, you write about Jesus. Uh, Moses, you write about the creation. Uh, you know, David, you can write some songs down. Yeah, that'd be fine. Is that what we're talking about? Uh, are you saying that God just gave the, the writer some thoughts or ideas? You know, when I was in school, <clears throat> sometimes the teacher, if I had an English class or a literature class or something, the teacher might give us a, a topic. He said, write, a, write 15 minutes on this topic. All right? So it's like, what? Yeah, just, is that what God did? Well, friends, if, if this is what the viewer is saying, then there's going to be a big, big problem with this. And it starts off with what the Bible says about itself. Listen, when we're talking about inspiration, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about plenary. Now, that, well, that's a kind of a fancy word. It sounds, sounds, sounds kind of crazy, but really what it means is complete. We're talking about complete inspiration of the Bible. In other words, this book was not just inspired in part by God or parts of it inspired by God. We're saying the Bible is completely inspired by God. Now, your friends in the Mormon church or your friends in the Nation of Islam or Islam, some others, they would say, well, the Bible is inspired in as much as it's translated correctly. Or the Muslims would say, well, it's the truth of God's Word. You know, I believe in the truth of the Bible. And so, really, they're denying the inspiration of the Bible. But friends, the whole Bible is God's Word, and the whole of God's Word is inspired. That is, it is, it is God-breathed. Listen to what Paul says. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture, that is all divine writings here in the Bible, are given by inspiration of God. That is, that word means God breathed. So every scripture is God breathed. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished with all good works. Now, friends, if the Bible is simply inspired generically, that is, the, the, the principle or the concept of the Bible is inspired, or the books of the Bible are inspired, but not word for word, then how do you know that you have everything that you need for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness? How do you know that the man of God can be, may be perfectly furnished unto all these good works? If the books of the Bible are just inspired, but not word for word. How do you know somebody didn't come along and change these words? Take them out. How do you know somebody didn't come along and say, well, we're just going to take this book out of the Bible? Now, that may be a whole other lesson. But I'm saying when you say, when someone says, well, that's not really inspired by God word for word, then you start running headlong into what the Bible says about itself. It says it is inspired, that it is, it is God breathed. Let's look at another, at another verse here. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. 2 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 20. Peter says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, friends, we need to understand something. When Peter makes this statement, he is not saying, he's not talking about uh, your take on what the Bible means. That's not what private interpretation means. He's not talking about, well, it's a, you know, you have your idea and this is my, that's your interpretation, it's my interpretation. No. When he says no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, he's talking about the source. He's talking about from whence it came. Because notice what he says. He says no Scripture, prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation for, now he's going to tell you why he said that, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. See, it didn't come by the will of man. It's not of any private interpretation. It's not of any private source. Some man didn't come up and say, well, this is my idea on what happened. When you read the book of Genesis, 
and you read about the creation, that's not Moses' idea about what happened. That's God telling, dictating, word for word to Moses what took place in the beginning. All right? So no prophecy of Scripture is of any, is of any private interpretation. It didn't come in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God, notice this, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So when you talk about the Bible and you consider uh, what the Bible uh, says, you need to realize that those words were spoken by holy men. All right? The Holy, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, gave them the words to speak. Now you might be saying, well, James, that can still be inspired like the viewer is talking about and just say, well... The, the Holy Spirit said, well, just, you know, Obadiah, just uh, write about Edom. You know, write about what's coming to Edom. Or Isaiah, you just write about the Messiah. Or Paul, you write a letter to the Romans. You just, whatever you want to write, just, you know, fire them off a letter. No, holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so... We're talking about the source here. They did not get to pick and choose <clears throat> the words or the topics or the thoughts. The Bible is completely inspired by God. Now, if you want to say completely inspired by God, you have to think about another way or another uh, means in which it's inspired, and that is verbally. Sometimes you may hear someone say that the Bible is plenary, inspired and or, and or that is verbally inspired. But friends, you can't separate these two. When we talk about the Bible being inspired, we're talking about completely, that's plenary, completely inspired and verbally. That is verbal inspiration, meaning that the actual words were inspired. That is that God used men as the mouthpiece for what he was going to say. And he used their words. He guided them to say words and write and write words. <clears throat> excuse me, that could be used to then reveal His will to men. Uh, let's just look here at Hebrews chapter one for a moment. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manner spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in his last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, but whom also made the words. So, he, he is speaking to the fathers and the prophets, and now he speaks through his Son. So, friends, when God speaks, he's using words. All right, he's using words. Now, he used men as mouthpieces, and he gave them what to say. Now, notice, when you talk about a prophet, when you're talking about a prophet, you're talking about a mouthpiece for God. In Exodus chapter 7, now this is a good uh, uh, example of what a prophet was, how a prophet related to God. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, The Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Now, how was Moses a god to Pharaoh? Moses didn't talk. Moses didn't talk. Aaron did the talking. Aaron was the prophet. Now, how do we know that? Well, let's, wind, let's rewind a little bit. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10. Now, this is when God has appeared to Moses and he's telling him, you go down and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses is making all these excuses about, well... Listen, he says, I am not eloquent. Neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servants, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Heard a man say one time, anybody that uses the word eloquent is eloquent. All right? If he says, I, I'm not eloquent. Well, you knew how to say, say that big fancy word, right? He's using all these excuses. Well, I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? And who maketh the dumb and the, or the deaf or the seeing or the blind? 
Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Now friends, that's, that sounds pretty much word for word to me. Sounds pretty much like God is dealing directly with what Moses is going to say. Not just giving him a thought, but actually giving him the words. And he said, verse 13, Moses said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron thy uh, brother, uh, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, and when he seeth thee, he shall <clears throat> be glad in his heart. Verse 15. Uh, and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of a God. So a prophet was a spokesperson for God. Friends, he did not get the leeway of saying what he wanted to say. God was telling the prophets exactly what to say or exactly what to write. That is what we mean by plenary, verbally inspired, or completely verbally inspired inspired. Every word was God breathed. God was dealing with their mouth and telling them exactly what to say. Notice what God says to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 verse 9. And the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Now friends, that's, that to me sounds very much like a word for word uh, expression of what God wanted them to say. All right? So it was word for word. Now, in Deuteronomy 18, in verse 18, listen again. Now, this is, this is what God is telling Moses, and he's talking. It's, it's going to be about Christ. He's actually uh, uh, prophesying about Christ. He said, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now, friends, I don't know if maybe someone just told the, uh, the viewer that the Bible is inspired but not dictated word for word, and he just didn't think about it. But, friends, there is so much evidence in the Bible that claims a word for word translate or word for word uh, uh, inspiration of the, of the Bible. God said, I'm going to raise up this prophet and I'm going to put my words in his mouth and he is going to speak those words. Everything I say to him, he's going to speak them. And notice the, notice the contrast. Come down to verse 20. Uh, all right, let's just go ahead and read verse 19. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, those are God's words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require of him. But the prophet, which presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Now, friend, you see how, how uh, concerned God was about making sure his message was delivered? I'm going to put my words in his mouth and whatever I command him, he's going to say but not only that, if he presumes to speak one word, one word that I didn't command him, it sounds to me like God was concerned about every single word that was going to be spoken. Again, you have this, uh, David in 2 Samuel 23 and verse 2. 2 Samuel 23 and verse 2. He said, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and, the, and His word was in my tongue. Friends, when you read, when you pick up the Bible, you're picking up what God said. All right? God used men to write this book. God used men and gave them exactly the words to use. Notice, in 1, Peter, uh, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, 
Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. All right? Clearly speaking. He's speaking words. He's not giving thoughts. He's giving words. Now, why is this important, you might say? Why, why is it important, James, that it's not thoughts? Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment. I want you just to be thinking about that. Why are we so stressed or stressing the need to give, have a word-for-word -word translation or word-for-word -word, uh, inspiration of the Bible? Friends, if God wanted to convey His will to us, He would do so in a way that we could understand it and make sure that He's given us exactly what He wants to give us. Now, you might say, well, how do we know? How do we know that God didn't just use secretaries, use men as secretaries? And uh, over the course of 1,600 years, the Bible was written. How do, how do you know that those 40-some men that God used, how do you know that He just didn't say, all right, David, take a letter, take a note, and start telling him what to write? How do you know that? Well, friends, one way you know that God didn't just dictate is by the writers using their own personalities. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, if I'm dictating a letter and I'm, I'm telling someone, I'm someone sitting over here writing, and they're writing down every word I say. Uh, and then another person, you know, their hand gets tired and they say, well, I'm, I'm going to write down, I'm going to swap out and let somebody else write. You wouldn't really notice a difference in the language because it's all coming from me. See that? You say, well, that sounds like James is writing. Yeah, but five people, you know, were involved in writing what James said. But you couldn't really know that because it all sounds like the way I talk. But friends, you know, when you read a letter, when you read a letter, you can say, well, boy, that, that sounds like oh so-and-so. You can tell by the way people write and by the way they talk whether... They were involved in the writing process. All right? And that's what you find in the Bible. When you read the Bible, you find all kinds of different personalities. And you find it coming out in their writing. All right? You, you find it coming out in, in the way they write. Uh, for example, Mark 14, verse 47. Here's two different accounts of what happened in the garden when Peter cut off the ear of Malchus. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now Luke's account is a little different. Luke 22 verse 50 says one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Now friends, Luke is a doctor. And when you read through Luke's writings, you start noticing all the little uh, subtle, if you will, uh, um, what references to, uh, you know, medicine. Like, for example, in Acts, let's just look at this. In Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, Luke is writing is right the book of Acts. Luke wrote the book of Acts. And here's Peter and John, they're going up to the temple about the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the gate, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now notice verse 7. And he took him by the right hand. Why not just take him by the hand? He took him by the right hand, and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, Luke is a doctor, so he's paying attention to what, which hand it was, and feet and ankle bones. Why not just say he took him by the hand and lifted him up, and his legs received strength, or he's able to walk. Leaping, and, uh, leaping up, and stood and walked, and, entered the, and with him into the temple. 
because that's Luke's style, Luke's personality. When you read uh, John, you read the, the book of John, the Gospel of John, or 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, you start seeing the, uh, a, a very love, you know, a lot, a lot of focus on love and just a different nature than what you read about in the letters that Paul wrote. And all of that indicates that God was behind all of these men and their writings. He was giving them the words to speak. At the same time, he was using their particular vocabulary. Now, that has to be inspiration. Because only God could take a, a, a man and dictate to him what to write and know the language or know the, the vocabulary of the man. You know, if you're, uh, if you're reading... Uh, 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 let's say you're reading a, a letter and uh, it's written by a lawyer. Man, it's going to sound a whole lot different than a letter that's just written by a farmer. You know why? Because the lawyer is going to have a different vocabulary. He's going to talk differently and thus he's going to write differently. But So God used all these personalities of these people and he included them in the Bible. So when he was dictating to them word for word what to write or what to say, he was using also their personality. Listen, in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, why would Peter say, 2 Peter 3, 15, Peter says, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written, how do you know the difference between Paul's writing and Peter's writing? As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of those things in which some, are, some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do other scriptures unto their own destruction. Uh, why would he say also in all his epistles, writing in them those things which are sometimes hard to be understood? Why talk about Paul's epistles, the ones Paul wrote, if you really can't tell the difference between who wrote what. Why don't he just say, uh, as also in all of our epistles, or uh, as Paul is writing, I mean, why am I talking about Paul writing? You see, because Paul has a certain style. There's, I mean, there's, a, there's a, a way in which you know this is Paul's writings. Paul wrote this letter. It wasn't just dictated. It wasn't just dictated words. And so when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, guiding men into all truth and giving them inspiration. Friends, the Bible is, inspired, is the inspired Word of God. Now, I want you to consider this. Let's slow down just a minute here. And consider something about the Spirit giving words to speak and write. Friends, do you realize when, when the Bible was written, the Holy Spirit was guiding people, guiding these men into all truth. John 16, verse 13. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he, shall he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So the Holy Spirit is guiding men into all truth. He's giving them words that he hears. And they are writing them down, or they're speaking them. Now, notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. He said, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, did that enter into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now listen, the Spirit of God is going to tell us some things from God's mind. What's He going to do? How's He going to do that? 
Paul says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, Paul is saying God gave us the word. The Spirit gave us the words that God wanted us to know. And the reason why we know the Bible is inspired of God, word for word, dictated word for word, is because this verse here. Listen again what Paul says. The Holy Ghost teaches the things that come from God's mind. The Holy Ghost teaches comparing Spiritual things with spiritual. Now that's kind of a hard phrase. Uh, I, I don't think it's translated really clearly. But the idea, the, what is, what is the idea behind it is the Holy Ghost is teaching, comparing spiritual things with the exact word or the exact phrase to convey the thought. Spiritual things with spiritual. All right? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So when, when Paul is writing, or when Peter's writing, and God is using them, there is a specific thing in mind that God wants them to convey, and he knows the exact word to use. Now, you may have been in a situation where you're trying to think of a word or a way to describe something. It's, well, I don't really know how to do it. Well, because the Spirit was inspiring these men to write, he guided them to use the exact, precise word to know exactly and precisely what God wanted to convey. Now, friends, you don't get that if you just have thought inspiration. You don't get that if you say, well, the Bible is just, is just inspired, but it's not dictated word for word. Well, friends, if that's the case, you don't get the precision of these exact words. How did God want us to, uh, to act exactly? What did God want us to do exactly? We wouldn't know that if it weren't for uh, a dictated, a word-for-word -word, uh, dictation of, uh, of, of, of the Bible. So friends, this is why it's very important that we have an inspired Word of God that is dictated word-for-word. -word. Now, if you think that, well, that's not, that's not good enough, I'm not satisfied that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. I'm not satisfied that uh, the Bible is, is not just a, a, a book or a collection of men's thoughts. I want you to consider this. In Matthew, let's just go, no, let's go to Luke. Luke 4 and verse 4. Luke 4 and verse 4. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Every word of God. Jesus, when he's talking to the devil, he indicates that the Bible is given word for word. Every word of God, not every thought of God, not just a general idea of God, not just a brief summary of what God thought, but the exact words. Now, in Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew 4 and verse 4, Jesus said this way, The tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of Man, Son of God, command these stones to be uh, made to bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Friends, if the Bible is not a word-for-word -word translation, then there's been a whole lot of words added. Jesus said, man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If it's just a thought translation, then there needs to be some words taken out. Because surely, you know, God only dictated a certain number of words that proceeded out of his mouth. Well, 
What about the rest of the words? Who put those in there? So the Bible talks about a, a direct inspiration guide, uh, guided by God. God gave these men the word to use, and he used their personality, their own vocabulary to do it. Which again goes to the inspiration of the Bible. That's how we know, that's how we know the Bible is inspired. Now, you might say, well, well, James, that really doesn't prove the Bible's inspired just because the Bible says so. Well, friends, stop and think about this. Stop and think about the fact that the Bible was written by about 40 men over a period of 1,600 years. Those men lived on at least two continents, maybe three if you count uh, Jeremiah was down in, in Egypt at one point. So let's just say two continents. On, th on two continents over a period of 1,600 years, 40 men writing a book. But not only, not only did those 40 men write a book uh, that is in agreement and has harmony over a period of 1,600 years, they also wrote in at least three different languages. You got Aramaic, you got Hebrew, and you got Greek. So, 40 men on at least two different continents over a period of 1,600 years writing in three different languages, all writing different styles, and yet all of their writings, all of their writings are in agreement. Now friends, if there's just some thought, if God gave some leeway to men thinking, you know, if he gave them some general ideas to write about, and man gets to put his own words and his own thoughts in there, you'd have some contradictions. You'd have some, some, uh, 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 some difficulty, some, some uh, contradictions to where uh, these men over this great period of time surely would be in conflict. But notice, Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 35, in talking to the, the Jewish people, now notice this, let's back up a little bit and get a little context here. In John 10 verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do ye stone me? Excuse me? The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods? Now he's quoting the psalm, and he said, Look, the psalm said that these men are gods. He called them gods. If he called them gods into whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath uh, say ye him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. He said the, only, the, the psalmist actually called called you gods, the Son of God. So. So he said the scripture can't be broken. In other words, there is going to be some consistency and some continuity there that you won't have if man just put down some thoughts and some, some uh, various and sundry ramblings. But the Bible is consistent. Therefore, it's written by God. Okay. You're in the word from the Lord. Yeah, good evening, James. Hey, good uh, evening. Just uh, listening to what you're saying and to confirm that, what we have today are people saying that God's talking through them, that they're, what, they're all Christians, and yet they don't coincide or come into agreement on anything that right. they claim that the Holy Spirit is guiding them toward. And they could, that's right, so, so yeah, the caller's making the point that all these people are claiming God's speaking to them, and they're speaking so many different things. And here's the thing, they could, they could get together and, you know, put their heads together and say, all right, now we're going to make sure that everything's in agreement, right? I mean, they could all get in the same room or teleconference or something and say, all right, now this is what we're going to say God said. And they still can't be in agreement. You know, they still won't be in agreement on it all. But yet we're talking about the Bible written by uh, about 40 men that there's no way they all, they all could get into the, uh, the same room together 
and put their heads together and devise a plan where everything they ride is going to be in agreement with the other. It's just, it's just not possible. So that's, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. And another thing is, is if they all do believe that they have the inspired Word of God, why aren't they adding to the Bible directly? I know they all come up with their books every year and then revise them and all that stuff, but why aren't they simply adding to the Bible? Because that's what happened for 1,600 years, didn't it? Right. Or, or correcting the Bible. I mean, let's get a, let's get a flawless uh, translation of the Bible. You know, if, if, you're, if you're guided by the Holy Spirit and say you've got the gift of interpretation or whatever, man, let's just, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's get a translation that takes out all the Easter's and, you know, let's put the word Passover in there or whatever. Let's make sure everything is just, I'm talking about every jot and every tittle, every dot and every, you know, ever ever T dotted and every I crossed. I mean, let's get it all right, you know, but, but they can't do that. Well, I would say the reason why they're not adding it to the Bible is because they would say, well, the Bible says don't add to. But yet, you know, yeah. but, but yet they're saying they, they've got more revelation. Right, right. Well, thank you for the broadcast. All right, all right. Thanks for your call. Uh, yeah, it's funny. The, 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 the verses that people always use, you know, well, no doubt about it, they're... They're the exact word of God, but when it comes to doing what they want to do, it's a little more ambiguous, I guess. I don't know. So, again, it goes to how do people really uh, treat and view the Bible? How do they really feel about the inspiration of the Bible? Do they really believe it's inspired? Friends, I'm going to tell you, the reason why you, we have all the trouble that we have in the world is because people don't believe that the Bible is inspired, that it is word for word inspired. Because when you say, well, there's a gen it's just generally inspired, you open the door to bring other things in. You open the door to, for people to rationalize or justify what they do because they don't really believe the Bible. It's really, on a smaller scale, it's the same, uh, uh, same argument that the atheist would use who says, well, I don't believe there's a God. Well, the reason why he doesn't do that is because he knows if there is a God, he's going to be accountable to it. Well, let's just don't be so strong, but you have these people that say, well, I believe the Bible, but I just believe the truth of the Bible or that it's kind of vaguely inspired, not word for word inspired. Well, what does that mean? That means they want some wiggle room. They want to be able to do what they want to do, add something to it. And that's why it's so important. That's why it matters to us. If we don't have <clears throat> the exact words, if we don't have a word-for-word -word translation of the Bible, then how are we ever going to know the will of God? How can you say, this is what God wants for me to do? Because the minute you say, well, this is what God told me to do, somebody's going to say, well, no, that's just, you know, that's a loose translation of it. And maybe that's why they will then turn around and say, well, that's your interpretation of it. Why? Because they don't believe that God gave them the exact words. That's why they want to say, well, we can't understand the Bible a lot. You must not believe in the inspired word of God. You must not believe that every word of the Bible is inspired. If you did, you wouldn't say, well, we can't understand it. Maybe that's why they say that. Maybe it's because they don't really believe that the Bible is inspired. They don't really believe we have that every word is inspired, inspired of God. Because surely if they believed that every word was inspired of God, they wouldn't then turn around and say, we can't understand it. We can't agree with it. See, it all comes down to how do you feel about the Bible? Is it going to be your standard of authority? Is it going to be the rule, the guideline that you're going to use in your life? Or not. If it is, then it has to be the inspired word of God. Otherwise, there can there's no way we can have unity, and there's no way we can have uh, the mind of God. See, how do you know what truth is? But yet Jesus said, "Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth." Well, which word? Which word in here is truth? You know, every other word, every third word, every second verse. You know. 
Every tenth verse, every third chapter, which one's true? If you start saying, well, it's just loosely inspired or just kind of inspired, then you're going to tell us, well, which word actually is God's word? Because we know God spoke some word. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. You know why? Every word in the Bible proceeded out of the mouth of God. That's why, friends, when you, when you hear the Bible read, you're actually hearing God, uh, God speak. Uh, in Matthew 22 and verse 30, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? Saying, God spoke and it was written down. And so when they were to read, or when they read it, they were reading what God spoke. It's just as if God spoke it to them. Why did you say, have you not read, you know, the loosely translated, uh, inspired thought of what God said? But he said, God spoke. Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God? The power of the word is what we're dealing with here. The power of the word and how people feel about it is what's on, is what's on the table here. See, it looks this. In, in Acts 1 verse 16, Men and brethren, the scriptures must need have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide them to Jesus. God used men's tongues, his word, their words, and he wrote the Bible. He put his words in their tongues using their vocabulary, their, uh, uh, you know, their flair, their writing, their style, whatever, and he gave us the word. Now you say, well, well James, what does that do with uh, your preaching and teaching? What difference does it make? Well, friends, if the Bible is not inspired, and this is not the Word of God, then here's what man does. Man can add to it, and that's exactly what you have. This is a, this is a copy of the, of the preface of the NIV. Now, that's a very popular uh, version. I call it perversion. But this is the, the preface of the NIV. And I want you to notice this, friends. This is what they said about the book. In the preface of the, excuse me, of the NIV, this was the goal of the writers. I want to read this to you. And I hope you can read that. <clears throat> Maybe you can't. It said, the, uh, uh, the translators, they agree that the Bible contains the answer to man's deepest needs and sets forth the way to his eternal well-being. Okay, that's great. That's great. The Bible sets forth the way to man's eternal well-being. But I notice this. Therefore, their first concern has been the accuracy of the translation and its fidelity to the... Here's the unline. To the thought of the New Testament writers. Friends, if you've got an NIV and that's the book you use, they're not really concerned about the exactness of what God said. They're telling you right off the bat. They don't believe the Bible is verbally and plenary uh, inspired. That is completely and verbally inspired. They're saying, well, the New Testament Bible just had some thoughts about the matter. That right there gives me concern. But then go on, it says, while they have weighed the significance of the lexical and grammatical details of the Greek text, they have striven for more than a word-for-word -word translation. More than a word-for-word -word translation? Friends, you mean to tell me that God wrote a book, guided men into all truth, used the precise word to convey the precise meaning that He wanted, and used words that uh, the writers that he was using would, would know, all right, their particular vocabulary, 
And now I'm going to come along and I'm going to pick up a version, a translation of, of, of his writing, of his word, and they're going to give me more than word for word? They're going to, they're going to start adding to it? See, friends, it goes down to the, it gets down to the, uh, how much you appreciate, respect, and, con and have concern for the Bible. Do you love the Bible? Do you want just the Bible? Do you want just the Bible uh, or the Bible only? If you want the Bible only, friends, then you have to be concerned about, is this book inspired of God? If you want just God's words, then you should be concerned about is every word in this book inspired of God? I can say with confidence the King James Version of the Bible was translated from the words of God. The words that were, that were trans, they were translated from were the words of God. The accurate words of God. Now, I'm not saying it, this book is not inspired in the sense of the men who wrote it weren't inspired. But the words, they, the, the, the manuscripts they used were indeed the words of God, the actual words of God that had been preserved for us. Now, friends, when you have versions like the NIV, they're not concerned about word for word. They're just concerned about the thoughts. And when that happens, friends, then you have people can add to. I mean, if they're going to give you the thought translation or more than a word for word, then what's to keep them from adding doctrines to it? And that's exactly what the NIV does. You can read the NIV and you can find born in sin. You can find all kinds of man-made doctrine in the NIV because they're not giving you a word for word translation of the Bible. That's how important it is, friends. That's why it's so important to us to say we're going to give you exactly what the Bible says. And we want a copy of the Bible that is based upon a word-for-word -word, uh, translation of, of God's, of God's a word to us. We want God's word. We don't want man's words. That's why we're saying you need to get rid of your creed books, your catechisms. Get rid of all the things that are added to the Bible. They may not be in the text, but you're adding them to it. Get rid of those things. And just get the Bible, the inspired Word of God. Yes, friends, the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It's word for word inspired. And that's what you'll get. When you uh, assemble with us, we're going to teach right out of the Bible. When you, when you come to our tent meetings or our Bible studies, our classes, our worship services, you just get, a, you get the Bible. You get the Bible, pure and unadulterated Word of God, inspired Word of God. Friends, I'm going to wrap up. I think we've got, we've got a tent commercial. Can you run a tent commercial? Uh... Time, got a few more minutes. I'm going to wrap up a couple minutes early so we can plug the tent. So uh, get that uh, queued up, if you will. Friends, we love you, appreciate you. Again, we want you to come out to the tent uh, starting Monday night, every night, 7 o'clock. Uh, no collections will be taken up, but your questions will be welcome. So we hope you come out and see us there at the, uh, the flea market there on Highway 58 in Broswell. Till next time, friends, thanks for watching. And if I can assist you in any way, I want to do that very thing to make sure that you get a word from the Lord. Have a good night.